Right now, as we speak, different parts of the U.S. are talking about vaccine passports to get into businesses. In New York, they already have these policies in place. They're going into place also in, in San Francisco. Los Angeles is talking about them even to the degree that they're discussing, at least, making it so you have to have a vaccine passport to go to the supermarket. Now, here to talk to us about this and where it's heading and what we can learn from it is John Tammy. He's vice president at FreedomWorks. And he's talking about this more from an economic standpoint and is about his latest book as well, which is When Politicians Panicked. And John, it's a real pleasure having you on Crossroads. Hey, Josh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so why don't we start by talking about kind of where things are at with the economic impact. We can give kind of a bigger picture of how this virus has affected the global economy and where things are heading with it right now. What's your take on this? The virus, it cannot be stressed enough that the virus did not cause a global economic contraction. What caused the contraction was politicians panicking. Uh, let's never forget that the virus had been spreading for months. It had been in the news for months. Yet U.S. shares in the stock market, and the U.S. stock market in many ways reflects what's happening in the world, continued to hit all-time highs. And so it was a signal that free people were responding and gradually taking more precautions against a spreading virus that no one knew a whole lot about, but things were going to be fine. It was only when politicians panicked and essentially took away our freedoms, took away the genius of the marketplace, whereby we dealt with something on our own without ha having command and control imposed on us, that markets started to correct and the global economy contracted. And so no one should be surprised by this. We know from the 20th century, command and control always shrinks an economy, whereas freedom tends to correlate with growth. And, and how do we see this with, the, with this virus? Because a lot of people might say, oh, well, if we didn't close down, maybe it would have spread worse. We needed the economic lockdowns. What would you say to that in terms of kind of the well-being of a society? There, it's a great question, and it's the essential question. And my response is that easily the worst excuses for the lockdowns, and many times these have been made on our side, were the ones that were given initially that we need two weeks to stop the spread because see if we don't separate people from each other, if we don't lock them down, they will engage in behavior that will cause them to be hospitalized and hospitals aren't prepared for. Well, what, what, what are, were they serious? Who needs to avoid behavior that might result in hospitalization? At which point they said, well, you know, there were studies coming out from the Imperial College in, in England saying that 2.3 million Americans would die unless their freedom was taken from them. Well, what if they predicted 30 million American deaths? If so, any force from politicians would have been wholly superfluous because no one's going to engage in behavior that, that could result in death they're going to lock down and quarantine and figure out ways to avoid being infected that politicians could never dream of. And so the more threatening something is, the more necessary freedom is and the more superfluous is government force. And so the taking of freedom never made sense. Hmm. You know, that, that's an interesting take because we have seen looking at different states and their lockdown policies that actually the ones that had stricter lockdown policies actually had higher death rates. And we could say part of that was because in a lot of these states, you had governors um, who made these lockdown policies. They took people who were elderly, infected with the virus, and put them into senior homes and forced the senior homes to take them. A lot of the deaths in the major cities, it seems, came from policies like this, meaning that government policy, interventionist policy, may have had a bigger contribution to the deaths than even just the natural way that people may have done things otherwise. Well, absolutely, you hit on the crucial point because it's not just that lockdowns take away our freedom, take away our ability to work, uh, take away just our, our, our just our natural ability to live. Lockdowns most crucially blind us. Because think about it, what you want when something you don't really know very well is spreading, you want millions and hundreds of millions of people trying different things. I know you know people because I know I people. I know I know libertarians who quite literally never went into a restaurant for over a year. I also know people like my wife who literally would jump off of a sidewalk if someone she didn't know was about to pass her. So fearful was she of a spreading virus. 
I know people like me for whom I couldn't get out in public enough. Every I would lie about, I, I would purposely forget things at the grocery store so that I could go back to the grocery store. And then we know young people who just threw caution to the wind altogether. It's the people who reject expert opinion. It's the people who do things differently. Those are your control groups. They produce the most crucial information. What is the behavior most consistent with getting sick and dying? And so you talk about these governors who imposed one size fits all solutions on their population. Is it any surprise that sometimes this was associated with much higher death rates? When you, ha when you take away that freedom, basically everyone's forced to do the same thing. And so if you're wrong, which usually command and control is wrong, you get like what happened in New York. And this, this is a very interesting take on it that I haven't really heard anyone mention before, that you know we have the marketplace of ideas that lets good ideas rise and bad ideas die out. We have the marketplace of you know, normal economics where businesses that do well succeed at those that don't sell products fail. But you also have the marketplace of, let's say, liberty and the marketplace of how you choose to live your life, where you see that some, some ways of doing things are more effective than others. And when it comes to, let's say, crisis, also looking at how people choose to have some latitude in their decisions, sometimes allowing that latitude may, let, may actually produce better results than having one centralized system that says this is how you have to do it regardless of your individual situation. Is this what you're kind of getting at with this? Oh, it, it's 100% what I'm getting at. Central planning fails 100% of the time, 100% of the time. Think about it. In a marketplace where everyone's required to do one thing, you get stagnation, you get contraction. Uh, we saw this from the Soviet Union since there, since there was no, people weren't free to try different things. Uh, life was defined by unrelenting drudgery. It's the outsiders trying new things that relentlessly improve our lives. And so health is no different. Free people produce, it's, freedom's not just a virtue, it's not just some gauzy thing that we talk about. Free people produce essential information. By being allowed to approach a problem differently, we learn best practices, we learn what's dangerous, but we also learn what's going to make us safe. And so politicians said the virus was a very major threat and they did the exact wrong thing because in taking away our freedom, they blinded us to answers about how to preserve ourselves with the virus spreading. You know, and on the idea of the marketplace of ideas, one of the big things we've seen is that big tech and big media have been working hand in hand with each other to restrict uh, discussions, even the ability to talk about possible treatments, uh, the ability to talk about possible things to increase your immune system, to strengthen your immune system. Any kind of medical discussions have been restricted online. People can't have these discussions anymore. And me that means, of course, that the only options available for your health are the ones given to you by this centralized system. And this brings us to the idea of this vaccine passport system they're now pushing where a lot of people just don't want it. They want to try other remedies and other ways of doing things that they believe may work better for them. Uh, what's your take on kind of the centralization of medicine that we're seeing? It's dangerous just like anything else. As I point out and when politicians panicked, uh, look back to the 1980s. Look back to the AIDS scare. No less than Anthony Fauci said back, he wrote a report in 1983 saying that AIDS could easily pass within a household. That's how communicative it was. Turned out he was wrong. Uh, the, the, it doesn't indict him that he's wrong. Science is all about learning. It's about doubt. It's about uh, positing certain things, but seeing through uh, freedom of action what actually causes something to spread. And it's the same idea here. There's so much we don't know. There was so much we didn't know about AIDS. We know more today. We're still learning right now about the virus that so much of what we assumed a month, six months, 17 months ago wasn't true. And again, that's why you want lots of people trying different things. That's why free thinkers were saying back in the 80s, you don't want government coming up with a cure for AIDS. You want crazy people coming. You want people trying different things coming up with an answer. And same idea here, uh, that those who support centralized medicine are ignoring the fact that entrepreneurs almost as a rule 
have an idea that's roundly rejected in the near term and then they come up with answers. And so uh, if the vaccine works, great. Information travels and people will gradually say, okay, the vaccine is the answer. But you want people trying different things just because knowledge doesn't age well. And for those who say, well, uh, people are committing suicide by not taking the vaccine, well, if that's true, don't worry about people not getting vaccinated because if suddenly the people unvaccinated are dropping and, and, and going to an early grave, that is, dare I say it, the market signal that's going to force many to get jabs who otherwise didn't get it. Let's never forget cocaine and heroin are Ill illegal, but what makes many people not use them is they know from people using them why they shouldn't use them.